If you want to turn to James, James, second, James, I've, you can turn to James. I'm not going to be there, but if you want to turn there, you can do that. Uh, <laughs> this is how this is going to go tonight, by the way. So I don't, those, I want to clarify, those of you that um, are looking at my bald head, I have another addition to my bald head. It's a round dot, and it's not a fly that's landed. And if you're looking there, it's actually paintball wound right there. So um, I have others, but I won't show you them. It would require me to get undressed. But um, this is how this happened, by the way. I was shot in the shoulder. When you're shot in paintball, which, by the way, you're not shot. When you're marked in paintball, because you don't shoot people, you mark people which I don't know what's worse. Anyway, so when you get marked, which I did in the shoulder, you're supposed to hold your gun up above your head and then you walk off the field. Well, I guess it's because I'm so awesome because I got shot and so I stood up and everyone just thought, now's the time to nail the pastor. <laughs> and so I stood up like this and I put my head down and do, 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 do. I got nailed and I yelled, I'm, I can't yell because of the microphone. I'm dead! <laughs> so anyway, that's my story. We're going to be in second Peter, not James. It's not because of the head wound. It's just because I'm tired. And when I'm tired, by the way, you never know what's coming out of my mouth. <laughs> and the guys will fill you in, maybe. I'm not going to on what was said. So you can ask them. Um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 through 15. Those of you that enjoy taking notes, and I'm glad that you do, if you are writing in your journals, the title of tonight's message is this, Overwhelming Obedience. What does it mean to be a person that understands obedience? What does it mean to be a person that as we engage in the purposes of God, as we engage in the kingdom of God, as we begin to engage in a culture that is unique and different from the culture in which we have come out of by becoming a child of God. What does it mean for us to be obedient? And there is a sense of of feeling overwhelmed. There's a sense of not just feeling overwhelmed, but being excited that obedience can overtake our life, that we can actually be consumed not in a negative way, but in a positive way with the power of the Holy Spirit that permeates every part of our being. So as we journey tonight through the text, that's what it's about. It's about us becoming consumed with the love and the passion and the overflow of who God is in our lives as his children. I'm going to read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 through 15, and then um, you can go ahead and turn there and put your thumb or finger or whatever you want to put there um, in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. Um, that's really going to parallel the thoughts of Peter as we look at a story in Luke, the Gospel of Luke in chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. So you can kind of look at those two things. But first... We're in 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers... Be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know that putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, 
and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Now, I want that to, to sit in your mind. I, I want it to be able to be a fence post that you have just created the hole, you have just poured the concrete, you have just established that post in the ground, and it is there solidifying so that you can begin to hang things on it. That's what a fence post is for, so you can hang those things on it. And as that's hanging there, I want us to go to Luke. As you turn to Luke chapter 8, I want you to begin to think about these concepts and these virtues that we discussed last week and begin to allow that to sink in as we read Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 1. By the way, this will be familiar to you. Soon after, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, <clears throat> and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who had provided for them out of their means. And when a great crowd was gathered, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be Saved, And the ones on the rocks are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, fall away. And so, for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. So, hopefully by now, if you are back into Second Peter, that post has solidified, and you're able to begin to hang things on the post, which is, in fact, the parable of the soils. As you are to understand what Peter is trying to get at in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 through 15, it's good to understand this whole movement that Jesus himself is talking about when it comes to how the Word of God falls on the lives of people. Soil number one. You can look at it in two different ways. You can look at it at the first when Jesus is telling the parable and the second when Jesus is describing the par parable. But soil number one is hard and unreceptive. The seed never penetrates the soil's hard exterior. And so the seed is wasted. It's for the birds. As you begin to think about this idea, it's true in nature. If you tried to plant, you just threw scattered seed and the, the ground was so hard that there was no way that that seed could penetrate getting through the ground that immediately a bird came and picked up the seed and took off because it didn't have the ability to stick to that ground. The practical sense, not just moving away from the seed, but actually moving into the lives of people, the practical sense is this. People are simply not interested. You share the word of God with them. You open your mouth. They hear it. They know that you are talking to them about Jesus. They know that you are talking to them about the gospel. You know that they know that you are talking to them about the cross and the resurrection. You can list a hundred different things that they know that you are talking to them about, but they don't hear anything you tell them when it comes to spiritual things. The enemy 
the birds, Satan, their own flesh, immediately takes away all hope. Immediately. They don't hear. It falls on hard ground. Soil number one. Soil number two is then a different type of soil. It is shallow. It actually has some give to it. It has some place for the seed to start. You see, life germinates and begins to grow. But the ground actually has no depth to sustain that growth. The elements are too much. The seed, even though it has started to grow in this shallow ground, can't penetrate through the depth of the ground. And therefore, when nature blows, literally, or things take place, it doesn't have the ability to survive. If you move from seed to practicality into the lives of people, initially, these people receive the message of the gospel with great joy. Whoa! This is incredible. This is awesome. This may have some application to my life. But when life has difficulties, then fear is the response. Isn't the gospel, isn't the word of God supposed to make my life easier is what they proclaim. And as they begin to see that life doesn't necessarily get easier, they give up. And they say, this is not for me. Their commitment is shallow. Soil number two. We then move from soil number one, hard and unreceptive, through soil number two, shallow, to soil number three. Soil number three, there's nothing wrong with the ground, but it's thorn-infested. There's quick growth. The seed finds good quality soil and begins to drive its roots deep, but the weeds are growing just as quickly around the roots and around the seed, and so the weeds choke out the life of an otherwise healthy beginning of life. There's weeds that are growing simultaneously, and they just wrap themselves around it and choke the life out of the seed. If we begin to look from the seed to the practical, this is a person who gladly receives the gospel. This is a person that begins to grow. They know the truth, but you see the finer things in life get in the way. What could bear fruit is choked out by the things of this earth. Comfort becomes more important than service. Their own desires rule their lives not the person of Jesus. Soil number three. This gospel, this truth, is choked out of what would have been a healthy, fruit-bearing, life-giving plant. We then move to soil number four. Soil number four in this parable that Jesus speaks of is good soil. Everything is present for healthy and sustained growth. Longevity of healthy and sustained growth brings multiplication. It brings reproduction. This is the kind of plant that reproduces itself and then can be grafted into other areas and you can make a crop out of this sort of plant. This is the exciting, reproducible, let's get excited about what's happening in the health of the seed. The practical implication then of people are those who receive God's word. And as they receive God's word, it radically changes every inch segment of their life. It is a radical makeover. Jesus becomes the absolute center of their affections, leading to a life that bears fruit. Jesus is the center. The life source is solid. Their life is a product of obedience and living according to the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus being the very center of their affections. Because of that, the fruit in which they bear can so rapidly multiply that it can multiply 30, 60, and some even a hundred times. Soil number four, the good soil. 
Let's go back to verse 8 of 2 Peter chapter 1. You now have a fence post. It's solidified. It's solid. You read that passage. We've gone. We've just hung a piece of fence onto that fence post, which was the soil, and now we're going to look at it for a while. We're going to discover it through what is this Second Peter telling us about in verse 8. And it's not Second Peter. What's Peter telling us in his letter, Second Peter, of verse 8? For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8. If these qualities. Well, Peter is summarizing the first seven verses of his second letter. He's describing qualities. Well, what qualities did he just describe? Well, we just talked about that last week, and these qualities are a godly pursuit. They're qualities that are described as virtuous. They're qualities that are described as in taking these virtues of what? Knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. We talked about those things. They're not master one, then move on to the next. They're not, oh, which one am I great at? Which one am I bad at? No. When you enter into a relationship with Jesus, these virtues are there. The soil is good. You're able to live a life differently. The old is gone. The new has come. If these qualities are there, then you will begin to live a certain type of life. So verse 8 continues. For if these qualities are yours and are what? Increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's two descriptions of these qualities. The first is they're present. They're there. So if you are a child of God, these are the realities of your life. They're there. This is a tremendous blessing given to us by the grace of God. You enter into his family, you get these attributes. It's pretty exciting. It's pretty overwhelming as you begin to think about the process of obedience and how that relates to who you are in Christ. You see, the question, as we kind of fuse last week's message to tonight's message and begin to wrestle with it when it comes to the condition of the soils, is this. Are you daily experiencing these virtues as a normal part of your character? These are the things that help identify you as a child of God. Are these present? How do they manifest themselves in your everyday life? How is your character different now than it was prior to you coming into a relationship with Christ? Not only is the description of these qualities present in that they are there, but then there's another description, and the description is what? Increasing. So they're there and they're growing, they're increasing, but they're not growing quantitative. We're not looking at these, these virtues in our lives and saying, well, this year I am 5% more self-controlled than I was last year. And if things go according to my graph, I will next year be 13% more effective in my steadfastness. That is not what this is about. It is not about a meter that ramps up the, oh, eventually I will be 100%. The concept, the word, the choice of the language that Peter uses in the description of these virtues is abounding. These virtues will what? Overflow in your life. If you are his child, they will spew out of your being. You can't quantitate that. It's 100% all the time. Overwhelming obedience. These virtues overwhelm the character of our lives. This is totally equipped, whole transformation. 
If you've been paying attention, did you see what I did there? Those are the titles of the last two messages. Totally equipped, whole transformation that leads us to overwhelming obedience. What does it look like to take on these qualities? So here's the next question from are these virtues there in verse 8 to are these virtues increasing in verse 8? Here's the question. Has your experience with Jesus changed you? Are you changed? Do you view the world differently? Do you treat others differently? Do you look at yourself in the mirror differently? Are you a changed child of God? Are you made new? Does your life, what, overflow with the Holy Spirit? If not, why not? Why aren't you changed? Why isn't God overwhelming you with his presence? What is going on in your life that may or may not be holding you back from these virtues existing? You see, when the virtues both exist and increase or abound or overflow in believers, then believers are effective and fruitful when it comes to their knowledge of Christ. You see, Peter uses a negative to describe the lack of these virtues' presence. He says ineffective, and ineffective is based on the concept of being an idle worker who are wasting their day in the marketplace instead of working. All of you have been at a job or in a position where that's, there's that one or there's that two or you don't want those two people to show up at, to work at the same time because they never get anything done. They're always gabbing. They're always in the back. They're always taking a break. They're always having to go to the bathroom. They're always having to do something that is totally what? Ineffective. We've all been there. Some of us have been there because that's us and we've changed, right? Because absolutely, that's not us anymore, right? I, I think about my first job was at Dairy Queen. I can make an ice cream cone like nobody. I go to Sweet Tomatoes and everyone just stands, a crowd just comes <laughs> because they're overflowing and they're just getting ice cream everywhere and I'm just like, everybody. People ask me all over the place, will you make my ice cream cone? It's, it's awesome. So, so that's, that's my experience with Dairy Queen. But I was a horrible, I actually got a job at Dairy Queen when I was 15. Don't tell the law, but that's what happened. So I started working at Dairy Queen when I was 15, and was I a very good worker? As good as a 15-year-old can be. I was in the freezer eating the blizzard <laughs> stuff. It just came in boxes, and I'd be like, I'm going to restock. <laughs> you think I'm lying. I'm not. It's amazing the amount of candy that shows up in a freezer. It's really cool. So I was ineffective. I was idle. I wasn't a very productive worker. That's what Peter is trying to get us to understand. We're idle. But James says that faith without works, hey, there's the James reference, by the way, is idle or ineffective. Being without fruit reminds us of the parable of the soils. What does it mean to be a person that does not bear fruit? What does it mean to ask ourselves some really hard questions? If the seed is sown among the thorns, it's unfruitful because it's unfruitful because the weeds have choked it out by the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of money. There's all kinds of reasons. You see, there is an absolute uncomfortable reality. I want you to, to, to take in these words that I'm choosing to use on purpose. There is an absolute, it means we're all uncomfortable with it, uncomfortable, so all of us are uncomfortable, reality that frequently people give no evidence of a genuine conversion. If you were to evaluate the lives of people who claim to be children of God with 
these virtues that are listed in Second Peter, they're present, they're overwhelming, are they? If you compare them with the parable that Jesus tells in Luke, it gets us to have this uncomfortable feeling deep within our gut that something is not quite right. Verse 9 then in 2 Peter says this, For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Peter says it very simply, the absence of these virtues displays blindness. If these aren't present, then you are walking around stumbling over things. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says this, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you, what? Out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why are these virtues present and increasing? So that we can proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of what? Being blind, the ability to engage in this marvelous light. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 says this, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Believers who confirm their call and election by living in a godly manner will not stumble. That is, they will not forsake God or abandon God. Jude chapter 1, verse 24. You don't often reference the book of Jude. There's only one chapter, so sometimes you can see Jude 24, and it's verse 24, but chapter 1. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. If you are a child of God, you live in the light. Darkness does not consume you. Darkness is not around you. You're able to navigate life because the light is present and therefore you don't stumble. It doesn't mean you don't sin. It means you are aware of what's happening so that you see life according to the knowledge of the glory of Christ. So there's a simple question after we read verse 9. It's simply this, how is your life a reflection of light? Jesus is light and the Holy Spirit now lives in you as his child. Therefore, are you reflecting his light? What does it look like for you to live out his Glory, His presence. Verses 10 and 11. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. This is, these, are, these are extreme words. You will not stumble. You will never fall. I mean, there's some assurance here that says, you are in the light. You can live with confidence. It doesn't mean that, again, that sin is going to just poof, go away, and you're not going to struggle with anything, but it does say that you have the ability to give your life in such a great, humble posture of overwhelming obedience that you will understand what it means to live holy, to live righteously, to live in a way that is pleasing to God, and you will increase your ability to do so. You will grow. You will move. You will excel. As you think through verse 11, it then says, For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
There's a couple of words in verses 10 and 11 that sometimes we struggle with. Those words are to make sure your calling and election are sure. When you go back to Peter's first letter, it says we are what? Elect exiles. He's used that word before. We've talked about that word, but we're going to talk about it a little more. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. What exactly is Peter talking about when he says never fall? For in this way, there will be a rich provision for you to enter into the eternal kingdom, which is where Jesus is. It's this whole concept, if you have heard it before, of the perseverance of the saints. What does it mean to be a person who loves God, a person who has come into a relationship with Christ, and what does it mean to persevere as his child? 1 John chapter 2, verses 3-6 through 6 begin to explain this. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus walked. We will know who the followers of Jesus are by our fruit. We will know who is living a life of these virtuous qualities by their presence and their increasing, their overwhelming presence in their lives. John chapter 8 verse 31 says this, So Jesus said to the Jews, who had believed him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. There's a restfulness in the presence of God. There's an assurance that God is going to be faithful to complete the work in which he started as you entered into a relationship. And the only way you entered into that relationship is because God himself drew you to himself. John chapter 10, verses 26 through 30, hopefully we'll kind of put the final stamp on this thought of perseverance of the saints. You do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep, Jesus is speaking, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I love that passage. This illustration seems ridiculous when it's compared to the strength of this passage. I'm going to use it so you can kind of get the concept, but it's really bad. And what I mean by that is you guys have heard a lot of illustrations about my dog, Jasper. And Jasper gets a bad rap, but he's actually a pretty decent dog. Um, He listens pretty well, especially to me. He knows my voice. And he listens to me above all other people in my family. If my family is trying to get him to do something, he may do it but he can get pretty stubborn in his personality. But as soon as he sees that I'm serious about it, that dog moves because he knows he better. He knows that this is how this relationship works. Chad's the alpha and I'm not. So let's move in this direction, right? And so when you begin to see that, it's a really cheesy and a really bad illustration, but it proves the point that if two people were standing up here and I let Jasper into the room and I called him and you called him, he would come to me. He knows my voice. He's going to listen to me. As you begin to look at this passage, which is so far beyond anything of that metaphor, (laughs) Jesus is describing, but the people who are mine, my sheep, hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will not perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And even if you doubted that Jesus could keep your salvation, keep your relationship with him secure, then Jesus 
proves his point even further, and he says, but you know what? My father, he actually gave this flock to me. He actually put these people in my presence to care for, and he's greater than anyone. And so no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And then Jesus obviously puts this giant stamp on all of this and says, and by the way, me and God, we're one. There is a perseverance of are you abiding? Are you living? Are you in relationship with God? Are these virtues not just present, but are they increasing? And do we realize the the absolute uncomfortable reality that frequently people give no evidence of a genuine conversion? There are lots of people who claim the identity of Christ, but they are walking dead just like those who have never heard the gospel. What does it mean to understand these passages in a way that motivates us to live according to the truth that has been revealed to us? Verses 12 through 15. Because of all of what Peter just said, he says, So, therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. <laughs> Though you know them, you know what it means to follow Jesus. Though you know them, it's my job to constantly remind you of them. They are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. Reminders are powerful tools for action. We use our iPhones or other smartphones to remind us of certain things. We use calendars, we use friends, we use spouses to remind us of certain things. But when we look through pictures, oftentimes pictures can be huge, beautiful reminders of good things in life or tragic things in life. We use different things in our lives to be a reminder of power for our lives, brotherly affection and love move the community of faith to influence, to motivate, to bear with, to cheer on. We, as the body of Christ, can be reminders to each other that says, this life is worth living to be completely overwhelmed by the presence of Christ. At the men's retreat this last weekend, we had four guys kind of just share their life story. And as they began to talk, it was a beautiful reminder that other men who were sitting in the room listening to these four different men who have four different stories but see this golden thread of God's activity in their life, these other men who are listening to these four men can sit and say, wow, this is such a reminder that where I am, other people have been. What I'm frustrated by, other people have been frustrated by. The way those people's worlds have been rocked and the way I'm feeling right now, I can be encouraged to press on and to move and to increase in this joy of a knowledge of who God is. What does it mean for us to take on the words of Peter and to be believers that regularly are prompted to prize the gospel new every day? As Peter explains his words in verses 12 through 15, he's basically explaining all of verses 1 through 11, and he's hoping that his words would stab the believers awake so that they, his words, would reject what the opponents were teaching. Remember, 2 Peter was to, the letter, the the purpose of the letter was to speak against the false teaching that was happening in the churches. 
And so Peter was saying, I want to remind you of these virtues. I want to remind you of this godly life. I want to remind you of this knowledge of living according to the truth of Jesus so that this unbelief, this false teaching will go away. Believers know the gospel. You know the gospel. You can tell me the gospel. You might even be able to quote John 3.16. You have the ability to say, Chad, this is what Jesus did for me. But we also must not just assume that we know it, but we must move forward in a sense, relearn the gospel every day. It must impact your daily, hourly life. It's not just this one-time thing that I took care of when I was 9 or I took care of when I was 15 or I took care of when I was 22. No, it's this thing in life that, yes, there's assurance. I am Jesus's. He knows my name. I hear his voice. I listen to him. But every day I wake up and I say, this is what this life means. A life of security, a life of perseverance, a life of overflowing being in the presence of Jesus. So the question in this section is simply this. How are you experiencing a full knowledge of the gospel? How are you experiencing that? Not just I can tell the story of the gospel, but are you experiencing this fullness of the gospel? How is the vitality of the gospel experienced with you and those around you fresh every day? Can you give a gospel story that happened today? Can you talk about change and transformation and obedience and security and faith and grace and hope? And can you talk about what happened today? Is the gospel present today in your life? Think of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Is the fruit present in your life? How are you living that life afresh, anew? You see, when Peter is kind of doing the intro of this second letter, he's saying, hey, my life is short. God has revealed to me that my death will be soon. And in this state that Peter is in, his mission was laser sharp. And he is reminding the church to stay faithful. Stay faithful. Be soil number four. Be consumed with the presence of Christ. Be faithful in digging and cultivating and coming alongside your brothers and sisters to develop the strength to persevere through trial and through suffering and through accusation. What Peter is saying at the end of verses 14 and 15, he's saying the glory of Christ is absolutely worth you being overwhelmed in your obedience. Just read verses 1 through 15 again this week. Read the unbelievable assurance that Peter has that you will have everything for life and godliness. You will not stumble. You will not fall. I mean, Peter is laser sharp. This is the good life devoted to these things present if you have truly become his child. There's the post. There's the fence. There's some explanation. Now let's swing back to the soils as we close this evening. As you read the parable that Jesus gives in the Gospel of Luke, we can often be discouraged by that parable. But the truth of the matter is we must be encouraged by the parable of the soil. As you read it, you can naturally see that you're like, okay, 
I'm not sure why I should be encouraged by the fact that two-thirds of those who accept the message of the kingdom fizzle out and never bear fruit. That's encouraging? Two-thirds of people who initially respond to the gospel fizzle out. Well, I would say to you, and I've said to myself, that it is encouraging. This is hopeful. This is exciting. And you're saying, what? And I'm saying, yes, hopeful, exciting. This can cause us to be stirred by the affections of God. And this is why. Because I no longer and you no longer, as a true, genuine disciple of Jesus, need to feel responsible for the fruit or the lack thereof of the fruit in the lives of other people. It's not our burden to bear. We are not going to change anyone. The gospel changes people. And the fact of the matter is, when you read about the soils, two-thirds of the people that legitimately hear the message reject it. We don't need to bear that burden. If ten people accept the gospel, but only two bear fruit, who should we spend time with? These are hard questions, by the way. And some of us are very black and white, and some of you are going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If ten people hear the message, and as they get involved in a community, the fact of the matter is, Three out of four of those people are not going to bear fruit. And so what is our job as the church? What is our job as people who are committed to the mission of God? We need to be kind. We need to be considerate. We need to be perseverant to those who have not accepted the message of the gospel or have grown strong enough roots to bear fruit, but we do not need to babysit. And there's a big difference. Steadfast and faithful and perseverant and patient and prayerful that somehow God would change the condition of the soil that they've been exposed to, that they have been trying to figure out, and that through that, that soil that is overwhelmed with weeds and is trying to choke the life out of those people that we would pray and that God would change the effects of that person's life so that they can find the richness of good soil and bear fruit. But we cannot let the unfruitful distract us from the mission of God. We can't accommodate bad soil. Peter has said to us that life's too short. He says to us, we invest everything in those that will bear fruit. The potential, Peter says, is too great to spend our lives trying to process fruitless people. This is hard stuff. This is difficult stuff for those of us that are wired as people pleasers, those of us that are wired about how are people concerned about this or that or not. And you may be saying, isn't this the opposite of loving, Chad? Isn't this unloving to dismiss two-thirds of the population is what you might be hearing me say. And what I would say to you is I'm not callous and I'm not heartless, and I'm not just a thinker, but that as you read scripture and as you read the parable of the soils and as Jesus explains the parable of the soils and as you read the heart of Peter and as he ends, as he gets to the moments of the end of his life and he reflects, think of what Peter has seen. Peter has seen some pretty big stuff, huge stuff. He's been completely immersed in the life of Christ. He has witnessed the 
resurrection. He's witnessed the ascension. He was part of the inner circle. He saw the transfiguration. He knows Jesus above all things. And at the end of his life, he's reflecting on what matters. And what he says is, in all of the things that I've seen, we cannot waste our life on those things that are fruitless. We have to engage. Life is too important to not begin to invest in those that bear fruit. Peter says his goal is to be Jesus-centered. And I say about my life that I will not be callous and I will not be a thinker and I will not be heartless, but I will be centered on Christ. So how do we spend our time? How do we invest in people? People must be confronted by the consequences of their choices if they are to get to the heart of their need for Christ. We need to call a shriveling, pathetic, dying plant just that. And we need to help, if we can, revive that plant. But if that plant refuses to be revived, we move on to the next plant. One of the things they teach you in psychology and sociology is that you cannot work a person's case with more diligence or more perseverance or more heart or more patience than the person is willing to work their case. You can't change them. You can't make choices for them. And no matter how hard you try and no matter how burdensome it is, you can't do it. That's the world. But guess what? Jesus has said to us, it's also true in the spiritual realm, even though Jesus himself can do it, and Jesus has done it miraculously. He met Paul, and he said, you will no longer be a persecutor of Christians. You will be my faithful disciple. And, Peter, and Paul changed. But as we try to help people and as we try to engage with people and people continue to refuse what? These virtues that Peter has explained We have to say, I love you, but I am moving on. I will still come and see how things are going. I will still check in on you. I will still ask you if you're ready to then work your case. But I have to be involved in what Jesus is involved in. And what Jesus is involved in is people who bear fruit. What does it look like for us to be that type of community? You see, The reverse is actually true. To do anything else but what I just described is not more loving. It's cruel. It's selfish. And it's counterproductive. It's cruel because there's someone over here that wants to bear fruit. There's someone over here that's in really good soil. There's someone over here that would love your investment. But because you're so self-preoccupied by the fact that you can save this individual, this person is shriveling. We have to be aware of what's going on in our community and we have to engage in the reality of what it means to bear fruit. It's not a popular position, but it's the position of Christ.